Welcome everyone, namaste. Such an honor to be here with so many of you to talk about my, pretty much my favorite topic to talk about. Um, I'm always super happy to talk about these things and you don't know how uh, much it makes me happy to know that there are so many of you who actually are interested in listening. The whole idea is that I will speak for a while and then you're gonna have a lot of uh, room to ask uh, your questions. Uh, I have here Louise's phone. I'm not a very technical person, but I will do my best <laughs> to uh, uh, to see you, to look at your questions and answer them the best that I can. So um, I hope that you know by now, if you are here, you probably know by now that although the physical aspect of yoga has been given so much emphasis um, in our time and age, the physical aspect of yoga is truly uh, a very small part of this incredibly multi-dimensional practice that yoga is. Um, I, for one, started doing yoga really as a physical practice. I was just, I was performing and dancing at the time and I needed to find um, something that would give me the training that I was looking for, physical training that I was looking for that was not a dance class because I couldn't take those anymore. And I found yoga and it worked really well. It was hardcore workout. Um, but very, very soon I realized that this, um, the physical aspect alone is absolutely not what yoga is there to give us. And the gift that yoga is there to give, can give us is so incredibly um big, wider, and, and, and much more far-reaching than a great workout. Um, I also think that there is a lot of misunderstanding about what yoga philosophy is, that many people think that it's an intellectual conceptualization of things and you need to be very brainy, you know, and if you actually get into a lot of uh, philosophical um, books on yoga, there is quite a lot of that, many concepts that you have to learn in a language we don't know. So it can become kind of uh, distant and people have a little bit of a, um, I don't know, a b resistance towards it. Um, my experience is that yoga philosophy is not something that you understand so much with your brain as with your heart. That is something that immediately resonates in your heart as this, this is true. And this has relevance for my life. This has relevance for how I live my life and for the struggles that I go through. That's the whole point. The whole point of yoga philosophy, but yoga in general, is to free us. Is to free us from what binds us, what binds us to patterns of thinking, of feeling, and of acting that create suffering that creates struggle and challenge and suffering in our lives and in the lives of the people we come in touch with, which is nowadays something that can be very, very vast indeed. The whole point of yoga is to free us. And it frees us when you can l hear it, when you hear something, a teacher speaking or you read a book, whatever it is, and it resonates in your heart in a way that you think like this has relevance in my life. And I cannot tell you how much yoga philosophy has done this for me and continues to do this for me. It's there to actually, it has been laid out like a map of our consciousness, of our mind, and of the challenges that our minds are going to meet in this life and of the techniques and the science that we can use to deal with these challenges so that we can navigate the storms that are coming our way in a, in a way that is not only uh, comforting and helpful, but it's also fulfilling. That I find that the biggest gift of yoga is that it transforms what could potentially be incredibly painful and maybe continues to be painful, but what could be very crippling emotionally or mentally or physically and transform that into an opportunity for growth. I go through that in my own life. I m meet still, and I'm meeting Ed right now at this moment, uh, maybe one of the biggest challenges that I have ever met. And I am incredibly amazed <laughs> how yoga provides me with uh, pretty much a, a, a boat, a very secure, very safe, very steady boat to navigate those storms. Um, and I hope to be able in this talk to uh, give you a little bit of this sense of how yoga philosophy can help you find inside of you the, the support and the guidance and the compasses that we need in order to navigate those storms. So that's um, what I would like to talk to you about. 
yoga philosophy looks at the evolution of um, our evolution as as humans in pretty much the opposite way as Western science does. Western science looks at the evolution from us from being very rudimentary beings, like being one-celled uh, beings that could pretty much uh, uh, reproduce and excrete things, and that was pretty much it, what it could do. It had one cell. And then it evolved into a being that had more cells, and now it could procreate and excrete and also um, move a little bit in space. And then it evolved into a being that could then do all these things and also communicate. And through these millions of years of evolution, we arrived at this incredibly complex and sophisticated uh, body and mind and consciousness and brain and nervous system that is a human um, being. Yoga looks at it from actually the other way. Yoga says we at the beginning were gods. We were perfect. We were made of light and bliss and there was no opposition to that. We were one with everything that exists. We are made of light and we are made of bliss and we are made of divine material and through a complex process of if you will devolution we arrive at this messy thing <laughs> that we are right now so it's actually going from how we used to be and how we devolved into this complicated messed up uh, struggling beings that we are and by laying down this devolutionary path, it immediately gives us the way back towards it. So everything about yoga is explaining how we came to be and how we can find our way back into being, of realizing ourselves as beings of light and of bliss. So in yoga philosophy, uh, we talk about how the in the beginning there was the unmanifested absolute. And Saying that there was really empty words because when you say the unmanifested absolute, it by definition means that you cannot find something that a form that represents it. It's unmanifested, it's outside the world of form. And what it means is that before we entered into the world of creation, of form, of things, we were in a state of being, a state of consciousness where there was no conflict, no opposition, no duality. So there was just this web, the sea of interconnectedness between everything and everything was potential. So everything that every planet, every being, every insect, every angel, every stardust that ever was and ever will be was already contained in that incredible uh, concentrated sea of potential. But there was no manifested form in the world of creation. There was just this consciousness pretty much where everything vibrated in this frequency and everything was connected pretty much like a web where you know a little bit of, of, of uh, stimulus here is going to re reverberate throughout the whole structure. Um, if you will, that could you could compare that to what um, our you know scientists talk about what was there before the Big Bang is antimatter. So it's something that is not that does is not in the world of matter, is not in the world of creation and manifestation. Is something that our intellectual minds have incredible difficulty conceiving of. And the idea is that the vibration in this field of potential at a certain moment becomes so intense that it literally bursts into manifestation, bursts into creation, which again in how scientists look at it would be the Big Bang, the moment where that antimatter comes to such a state of concentrated uh, energy that it bursts into everything that exists in the universe, gazillions of galaxies and planets and solar systems throughout that are something that they call infinite. And actually they say that is still expanding. The Big Bang is still continuing. This effect is just in a much broader sense. And it's going to come to a maximum one day. And then it's going to start to come mo move back into nothingness a process that probably is going to take another few <laughs> gazillions of years so this movement of expansion and contraction that's exactly what the yogis say that's the first manifestation that there is the first um, pair the first duality the first thing that happens when this concentrated 
not formed universe expands into um, manifestation, into form, is that you have these two forces, that is expansion and contraction. Or you could say attraction and repulsion. Try to move away from repulsion being bad and attraction being good. Try to look at them as really uh, forces of nature. This incredible force of attraction, pulling things together, and this force of repulsion pushing things away. That's the first manifestation of form. And the yogis say that is this duality, this struggle between contraction and expansion between attraction and repulsion that gave birth to literally everything that exists and keeps on giving birth to everything that exists in the universe. All the pairs of opposites like light and dark or male and female or big and small or good and bad, all the pairs of opposites, they are consequences of this first pair of opposites of expansion and contraction or if you will, um, attraction and repulsion. Now, in the terms of the human mind, yogis say that the, this kind of absolute, the moment that it came into creation, something in it that was completely unified and one splits up. And now I step out of it and I say, I am this, I am not that. When you are in this unmanifested space, there is no I. The I is the big I that includes everything and everybody. But the moment you separate and you create this thought for yourself, I am this, you literally create a little body for yourself. It's not a body made of matter yet. It's a body made of thought, of idea. But the moment you say, I am this, and you look around figuratively, and you say like, this is I, this is not I, now you created again this repulsion, this attraction and, con and, and repulsion. Now you're separating yourself from something. Once you do that, you, there is something that coalesces into a, a sense of self, if you will. When you say, I am, you are, all this potential is kind of coagulating into something that is I. It's very, it's the first, um, everything that was flowy and everything that was actually constantly in this web state now comes back and coagulates into something that is very solid and unique, solid in terms of thought. I am. The moment that you say I am, the next, if you will, unfolding of consciousness is the moment that I say, I am this, I want to have an experience. So I, I want to like something. I don't like that. I wish I, I want that. I am good. I am bad. I am big. I am small. I am male. I am female. I'm a star. No, I'm a mountain. I am a bug. I am an angel. The I am-ness of us looks for manifestation. And according to yoga is that, so you have I am, my sense of self, and then it unfolds into this wanting to go out into the world and having experiences. Part of our mind, they call that manas, wants to experience, wants to through senses, which can be physical senses, but also we have senses that are only to do with emotions and with thinking. We want to go out into the world and have experiences. And once we go out into the world and have experiences, there is another part of the mind that unfolds that wants to understand, wants to know, what is this that I am feeling? Because you can taste something and say cold, that's just pure experience. But it's like, what, what is cold? Why is this cold? Is this good for me? Do I want this? Is this something that I should have? When you get into this thinking, more intellectualizing, conceptualizing, that's another part of your mind. This is something that is uniquely human. This wanting to go into the senses, this is a more something that we share with most animals. This feeling of, you know, there's food over there. There's a mate over there. I'm sleepy now. There is sun over here. It's warm. No, it's cold. This, this kind of experience and perception, we share that with animals, with sentient beings all over. But this unfolding of the mind that actually wants to understand and wants to understand if this is good or bad or where it's going to lead me, where it comes from, this is something that is uniquely human. 
And in the yoga philosophy, we call that buddhi, which has exactly the same uh, root as Buddha. Buddha is the realized one. Buddhi is what would take you into this higher states of consciousness. So according to yogis, we have the sense of self. That's the first formation of the human mind. And then this part of the mind who wants to go out into the world and have lots of experiences. And then this part of our mind who wants to actually rise above these experiences and understand them. If you will, this part of this manas, this part of the mind that wants to have experience, they say this is the part of repulsion. It wants to go out into the world and into getting into more and more and more experience, more and more manifestations. And buddhi is the part of our minds that wants to go back to that divine state, if you will. It's the part of our minds that has attraction. It's attracted towards that which is the source of us all. And manas wants to go away from that, the divinity thing, and let's go party. <laughs> so it wants just to go out into the world and have loads of experiences and make babies and eat stuff and, 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 and sleep and, and, and have fun and read and be entertained in every way that it can. So we say that that is repulsion because it is pulling away from our source into the world of manifestation. And buddhi is the part of our mind that wants to go back to that. But what am I? What are all these things? What do all these things mean? What do all these experiences give me? What did they come from? Where do I come from? All this kind of thinking mind of thinking is not a good term for it, but it's maybe it's normally translated for most people as the intellect, but I also don't find that very appropriate because you can be very intellectual, but not have this this attraction towards what is higher in you, which is the quality of buddhi. And it's uh, uniquely human. You know, if an animal is presented with a nice meal, it's not thinking, mm, shall I eat that? It's just going to go for it. But humans can think like, is this going to be good for me? Am I going to digest this well? Is this the right moment for me to eat? We have that capacity. We're not ever, we don't always use it, <laughs> maybe, but we have that capacity to, mm, no, I'm really attracted to that person, but is it correct to actually uh, have a sexual encounter with that being? Is that something that is going to be uh, good for me? Is it, is it right for my partner or that person's partner? Uh, an animal doesn't have that. It meets it's on heat or something or it meets a, a mate it's gonna go for it. it's not gonna you know wonder about it so this uniqueness of the human mind is buddhi is this capacity that you will have to reflect and to be pulled towards something that to actually be able to say to a to your senses or to your desires say like no not now i have something bigger to do here so this gives you a little bit of the yoga perspective of the human mind. And it gets super interesting because if you uh, read, I'm just coming from uh, teaching the Bhagavad Gita um, uh, last week in Portugal, and I am very uh, inspired by it always. It's Anybody who knows me knows that I'm always trying to talk about the Gita somehow. And I think that the Gita brings us an amazing metaphor for this that is very, very relevant for the struggles that we are going through. So if you bear with me just a little longer, there is the Gita, the Bhagavad Gita is a yoga text. If you're not familiar with it, it's one of the most loved yoga texts there are. There are not so many. Uh, yoga is was a very verbal, very oral tradition from teacher to student. But there are a few texts. And the Gita is incredibly loved. And what is less known is that the Gita is a smaller book contained within a very large book called the Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata tells a story of a family and the family has a kind of a forefather which is called Bhishma and he's an allegory for that coagulation of the sense of self of I and his offsprings are two brothers one is a blind man called Hitarashtra and he's a metaphor or an allegory if you will to that part of our minds that want to go out into the world and have experiences. And it is blind because that part of our mind is not concerned with right and wrong. It's not concerned with correct or incorrect, or is good or bad. That part of our mind just wants to go out there and have some fun. And then his brother is called Pandu, and he is the 
uh, allegory or the metaphor for Buddhi, he's always reflecting. He's a very, he's, he doesn't have much patience for palace life. They're kings and princes, they're princes, both of them. They don't have, he doesn't have much patience for the pa palace and court and politics and, uh, and, and pleasures, you know, and he, he's not into that. He wants to study and he wants to actually, he moves to the woods to live in the forest with his two wives because he wants to be in nature and he wants to be studying uh, the scriptures. He's not very interested in politics at all. And he is a metaphor to Buddhi, to this part of our minds who wants to understand, who wants to rise above the senses. Now, the blind king has a hundred sons, which is, again, a metaphor for the infinite number of desires and experiences that we can have in the material world. They are all desires. We can have desires for everything, for food and for drink and for substances and for entertainment and for company and for sex and for uh, money and for reputation and for fame and for whatever, followers. We have this, there are thousands of things, thousands of things, infinite things in the world of matter that attract us. That's the metaphor for the hundred sons of the sense mind, of the mind that just wants to have experiences, is going to keep generating things to have experiences with, which I think we see reflected in our daily life a lot. You know, how many restaurants and cafes and bistro bars and cinemas and theaters and books and streaming, the, everything, the whole of our society pretty much is based upon creating experiences for us to take us away from whatever internal experience you want to have so there is always you know some great meal to be had or some company some friend to email or someone to talk to or some experience to have in the world out there so that's the blind king and his hundred sons are a metaphor for that now the other guy the other brother pandu who's a metaphor for buddhi he has five sons, and all his sons are, it's too long a story for me to tell you the whole thing, but all the five sons are generated by a different god. So they are divine by nature, and they are a metaphor for the five centers of consciousness that we carry in our spine, centers of consciousness, and of uh, energy. We call them the chakras. And those five brothers are the metaphor for them, which these five centers, they are, they are our gates towards understanding and liberation. So while we have all these thousands of ways to go out into the world and have a good time, we have five gates to leave this world behind even for a little bit and to actually start to pay attention what is happening inside of you and hopefully one day awaken enough consciousness to free us from the things that bind us to this, uh, to this world of suffering. Now, these chakras, these centers, the, the characters, they, if they, they can be either, they can go with the desires and have a good time with them or they can say goodbye to them take some distance from it and actually focus on a more internal non-materialistic um, experience which is the situation as we find them they are cousins they are from the same family but they don't like each other at all they grow up together they always have some tension between them, you know, the, the, the bad guys, if you will, just to make it easier. They always want to damage the good guys somehow, and the good guys always escape. And they have this tension going, but they grow up together. Up to a point where it becomes too intense, and they actually send these good guys. They are the guys who are in power because the father of the five guys dies. So the blind king is the one who remains, so he is in power. So he is the one, his, him and his sons, they are the rulers. And th although the other guys have as much right to the throne or even more, they are sent away. And again, I'm going to spare you, there is many fantastic stories that happen, but I'm just going to try to cut to the chase. At a certain point, the tension between them becomes so unbearable that war is going to come. War is the only way for this to be solved. These guys have tricked them, have robbed them, have uh, abused them. The bad guys have abused the good guys in every way you can imagine. And after, and they, 
exile them for 13 years in the forest and they go and they do everything and then they say like okay after 13 years when you come back we will give you your part of the kingdom but of course when they come back they say no 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 we're not going to give you anything there is a lot of tension between them and finally there's going to be war between within this family and the allegory for that is for a long time in our lives we can let our addictions and our habits and our pleasures coexist with a sincere desire to be a good person or even to have a practice, a spiritual practice. I, the word spiritual is not very good here. What I mean with spiritual practice is a practice of ethics and of being a good person and of taking care of, you know, your what, how, you, how you treat other people and how you treat yourself to have this kind of uh, not only materialistic drive in your life. So we call that spiritual just for lack of a better word. So for a long time, those two can coexist together. There must be some tension sometimes. You know, you drink too much, you're going to feel it, you know, in meditation the next day. You eat too much, you're not going to be able to do your practice as well. You, but you can manage, you know. Okay, so one day it's not too good, but then the next day I'm better again. And then I'm good for like four or five days and then I go out. And then, but there is some balance there that you can keep on going for a long time. But at a certain point, one of them is going to be determining in your life. At some point, it's either going to be I'm out there for my career and the money and the pension that I'm going to get and the great social life that I have and the followers on Instagram that I have and the education, the high uh, level education of my children. And I'm really attached to the clothes and to the and this is really what is motivating my life. Or I actually want to work on myself and to free myself from the patterns of behavior that are binding me to suffering. There's going to be a moment where the dominance of one of these two is going to overrule the other. And we have a choice. We have a choice if we're going aside with the hundred gazillions of experiences that we want to have all the time. Or we're going to side with that internal connection that we can make inside of us. And that's the war that happens. And the explanation that Yogananda, who is the uh, teacher, yoga teacher that I follow, he, he's died, but I follow his teachings and his uh, books. He says that when you start to do yoga for a long time and meditate, you know, I never see the difference between doing yoga and meditation. Doing yoga is meditating. But, you know, you do your asana practice. You do some breathing exercises. You meditate a little. You try to be a good person. Once you start that for a long time, you can still have the same social life you always had. You can still, you know, work hard and get your money and enjoy your holidays and have fun. For a long time, you can keep them both coming. But there is a moment in your life that they are going to come into conflict. There's going to be a moment in your life when you're going to have to decide if you're going to continue with the habits and the enjoyments that you always did, or if you're going to drop some of that to give more emphasis to your practice. And that's when the Bhagavad Gita begins. That's the evening of the war. It's this it's happened some war in between us. The first verse of the Gita is the blind king asking his um, assistant, his secretary, who can see by mystic power, he can see what's happening in the battlefield. He asks, in the field of battle between my sons, the des material desires, and the sons of my brother, which are the five chakras within you, what are they doing? Or what, how do they do? In this field of battle, how do they do? It's one verse. Yogananda has more than 60 pages of commentary on that one verse alone. He says, this is the question we should ask ourselves every night. In the field of battle, in our lives, in our bodies, they are the field of battle. It's happening inside of us. It's how we are dealing with our addictions and our attachments and the things that we really like but we know are not good for us. And it's the, also the battlefield inside of us. How am I dealing with these forces inside of me? My anger and my frustration and my des depression and my desperation and my desire to do good. How are these forces doing? Who won today? 
in the battlefield of my life every evening. It's like, who won today? Did my best intentions win or did my addictions and my desires win? And this is that inner compass. This is something we should be willing to do, but not with a finger, a police kind of thing, because that only makes everything so incredibly, even more difficult than it is. The idea is to have complete honesty and complete friendliness. Compassion and strength, honesty, they strengthen each other. If you have a lot of strength, but you don't have compassion, it becomes aggressive and violent and harming very quickly. And if you have a lot of compassion, but you don't have any strength behind it, it becomes complacency and it becomes weakness very quickly. We need them to feed each other. So when we ask ourselves that at the end of the day, how did I do? And I had that conflict with the annoying coworker, or when I was standing in line and someone cut in front of me, or I was driving my car and someone did something silly. How did I react? D did I react in the ways that I always react in anger and in, uh, or, or, or the opposite of that, of feeling that I should go, go in fear? Or could I actually connect to what the person who I actually am, who I actually am, and act from there? And the Again, the, the meaning of that question, the purpose of that question is not to be a finger, but is to give us the opportunity to do better the next day. It's to give us the opportunity to grow, to look, because sometimes you're going to see that you do the same mistake over and over and over again. And how do you deal with that? And you don't deal with that with feeling uh, like a failure or self-loathing, which is like no how we normally react to these things. We should embrace that with enormous compassion, enormous, without tricking ourselves or kidding ourselves of saying like, oh, it's okay, it's not okay, but I am the actually, I'm the person who's actually suffering the most for doing that. We think that we are harming others, but we are harming ourselves, and this is what should be embraced in a compassionate way. And the yogis say that in the evening of this battle that is happening, the biggest warrior on the good side, which is related to the third chakra, asks Krishna, who is God incarnate, that was sixth chakra, asks the divine, which is, you could use that as a metaphor to your higher self, to who the best in you. He asks Krishna, the best in, in us, to look at the other army. So Krishna takes him in the chariot to see the, the enemy army. And what does he see there? He sees his cousins and his friends and his uncles and his teachers, people he grew up with. Those are the people he needs to slay, he needs to kill in this war. And again, that is a metaphor for what happens when we are in meditation and we actually want to, okay, I really want to do this. And you ask our, we ask ourselves, who is my enemy? I want to look at my enemy. And what we find are, you know, the food we love to eat, the people we love to gossip with, the, 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 all the comfort that money brings us, all the material things we are attached to, and we don't want to get rid of them. In truth, we don't want to get rid of them because they give us comfort in a life that is super difficult. And they give us a fleeting fulfillment and a fleeting feeling of something good in a world that is so hard. So the whole point is, do we actually want to get rid of these things? And then what continues is a whole dialogue between these two characters where Krishna is explaining to Arjuna, so the higher self is explaining, you're not going to miss any of that. You're not going to lose any of that. Your life's not going to be less pleasurable because you're giving that up. That's just what looks like from the beginning. Because it looks like if I'm not going to eat my chocolate every day, what's the point of living? I have actually had that thought in my head in my past life. You know, and someone told me, like, you really should cut the sugar. It's really bad for you. I was like, what's the point of living if I cannot eat sugar? <laughs> But once you do it, once you actually remove that, you understand that the, your f pleasure is not coming from that thing. Your pleasure is coming from a sense of comfort, which you can get from a huge contact with something deeper inside of you. 
The same is true for whatever drink gives you or shopping gives you or the comfort of having a big fat bank account or a company. All these things, it's not the things themselves that give us pleasure. It's what we believe these things are giving us. It's a maya. It's the illusion of the material world. Because if it would be really fulfilling, you would eat a chocolate one day and then say like, okay, I'm fulfilled and never need to eat chocolate again. But that's not what happens the next day. We want to have it again because the fulfillment, it never lasts. The fulfillment of material things never lasts. And this is something that is incredibly difficult to accept because our attachment to it is, and, and the comfort that we get from it is too big. And that's why the whole dialogue continues with our higher self, the higher inner saying, you are not everything that you think you're missing. You're going to get way more pleasure out of this contact with your inner self. And as these things exit your life, you're going to have so much more energy and so much more lasting enjoyment within yourself. You just need to give that one step and try to actually trust that there is something inside of you that is incredibly more worthwhile, is incredibly more precious and more valuable than any material thing that you could um, enjoy in the outside world. So that inner compass is that capacity to say, to believe there is more to life than material pleasures. I feel that. And it's not an idea in your head. It's an um, intuition, if you will, in your heart. It's an experience in your heart. There is something more to my life. There is something more to being human, to being here, than to have riches and to accumulate things and to buy million-dollar mansions. And there is something more to life than that. And that, even if it's a very th little, tiny little thought in the back of your head, that seed if you nourish it if you take care of it if you give it a little bit of space every day by sitting alone by coming down by saying temporarily no to all the distractions out there and actually spending some time within yourself you're gonna see that grow and you're gonna see how that takes over and then it's fine if you sometimes eat or if you sometimes drink or if you sometimes then it's fine because all these things are serving something bigger and that's the kind of tricky part is to understand that you give up on things so that you can let your true nature arise. And that true nature can, doesn't matter if you eat or you don't eat. And you can enjoy the food and you can also enjoy when it's not there. You can enjoy the, the money, sure, why not? It's great, but you are also fine if it's not there. You can enjoy the company. It's great to have company, but it's also fine to be alone. That's the difference that it, you're not a slave anymore to the outside world. There is something inside of you that makes even the outside world way more pleasurable. There was a mouthful. I have a lot more to say, <laughs> but I would love to give you some uh, space for questions if uh, that's something that you uh, would like to do. So uh, I'm looking here at the telephone to I know there is a little delay, so I'm going to wait for the questions to come. If they don't come, I'll talk more. <laughs> Chocolate cannot be bad for you. It's too good. <laughs> no illusion. I understand. Oh, I see. How did you study the Bhagavad Gita? Oh, who do you study with Bhagavad Gita with? Um, I studied the Bhagavad Gita with Paul Greeley. He's my teacher. And I've done uh, three or four courses on the Gita with him. And uh, he's the one who uh, opened me to this book on the Gita called God Talks, Talks to Arjuna from uh, Paramahansa Yogananda. They're two thick books like this. <laughs> it took me pretty much a year to read it from uh, beginning to end. But it's, uh, for me, it was life changing. He's the only one who makes these associations between the characters of the Mahabharata and the aspects of our psyche, of our um, consciousness. So easy. I'm going to explain. Thank you. Thank you. This was so nice. Thank you. There. Please leave your questions here. Have you got 
other retreats already planned. <laughs> um, I give this uh, Gita uh, retreat once a year in Portugal. Uh, it's probably going to happen September next year. I find that um, to actually really go into the Gita in a lot of detail, I really like to do that um, physically with people. You know, I want to be there for them because it can be quite intense to 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 meet those ideas and to look at your life in this way and I find that being in nature can be so helpful to uh, allow these teachings to really enter you and I like us to be together as a group there this is not something that I would um, teach online maybe online maybe yes but not as a as a video as you know, I have two courses uh, on philosophy on Eckhart Yoga. One is just a general introduction to yoga philosophy, and one is on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, who is, which is actually a rewrite of the Gita, in my opinion, um, just in a different kind of language. Um, so those two, I'm very confident that uh, you know you can enjoy them at home. But the Gita, I think, needs a, a little bit of a, a the physical presence of the teacher <laughs> there. Um, it is wonderful to listen to you, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. You guys are so awesome. <laughs> I'm looking here to see if there are more questions, but I don't see them coming. So while uh, they don't, oh, there is one. What a for one a deep understanding of the teachers. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Marianette. I am really connecting with your explanations and can't wait to explore further. Many, many thanks. Thank you, guys. You're so sweet. So uh, I wanted to tell you uh, just the main themes of the Gita, which I think they are incredibly helpful. Every time I read the Gita, you know, for me, it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's like you forget. And then you need to be reminded. That's why I'm actually almost, almost always reading it. And uh, there are a couple of main themes in the Gita, which I think are really helpful for us to remember <laughs> on a daily basis. First of one is we are not this body. So as much as we want to look good and to be healthy and to take care of ourselves, this is just a suit. It's a suit we put on at conception and we're going to leave it at the moment of death. And the more we can familiarize ourselves with that idea, the less uh, painful it will be the whole process of, you know, dealing with our physical difficulties, including health and, and aging and dying. This body is just a temporary suit for you. Take care of it, enjoy it, have great time with it. But no, it's not here forever. Then the second thing that the Gita keeps on saying is material things like defeat or victory or uh, success or failure or being poor or being rich or being beautiful or being ugly. Those things will not fulfill you for long. Have a good time with them. I'm not saying give up everything, go live in the mountain. Not if you can, great. But I'm not saying that. It's just know that those things are going to come and go in your life. And they are never, if you think like, I have to be rich to be happy, or I have to have gazillions of followers on Instagram, or I have to look a certain way to be happy, you're going to be in trouble very soon because these things are naturally going to come and go in your life. They should not be your big source of happiness and fulfillment. Then they say there is a divine spark in everything. Even in your addiction, there is a divine spark in there. There is something in there, in the back there, that is showing you something good, that can give you something good. There is a divine spark in every being, in every animal, in every um, creation. There is something there that is divine, and it makes our lives this incredible journey. Then it says... And this is maybe one of the hardest things for us. We have the right to action, but we don't have the right to the results of our actions. <laughs> so we have a right to show up and do our best. But what is actually going to be the result of what we are doing? Are you going to, people are going to love you or people are going to hate you. You're going to get a lot of money for it. You're not going to get anything from it. This is not in our hands. So working hard and doing your best and doing things with love, that's our job. 
and what's going to happen if it's going to give us everything that we wanted or it's going to be completely forgotten. That's not in our hands. Relax about it. <laughs> it's non-attachment. It means that I don't know. I don't know why one person gets a disease and another doesn't. Why the one person becomes famous and another doesn't. Why one person? That's not my job to know that. My job is to show up and do the best that I can. And that in itself is a huge reward. And finally, and it's the best news I can give you, it doesn't matter if you're going to get there. If your effort is sincere in this life, and this is a promise that Krishna does to Arjuna in the Gita, if you are sincere in your efforts, they will not be wasted. You will be rewarded. <laughs> Good things are going to come your way. The tricky thing is that in yoga, it might not be in this life. <laughs> it might be in another life. But there is nothing goes to waste here. Every sincere effort you put into this path is going to count. Let me see if there is a question. Otherwise, I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Have you... You make this really easy to understand. Thank you, guys. How do you recognize Maya? If all the external things in the world of desires are experienced through the senses? That's a great question. Everything is Maya. Everything that is not... <laughs> Everything that is not an experience of another kind is maya. And the experience of the other kind is samadhi. Is when your ego literally dissolves and you have a change of consciousness and you perceive things from a different place. Everything else is maya. But maya is not bad. Maya is normally translated as illusion. But for me, maya is like a magic trick. Magic trick that transforms the divine into a flower or into a pig or into a storm or into a word. But the divine is there. Maya just makes it look like it's something else. So our, our job is to see the divine, to see goodness, to see beauty in everything. It's what Maya gives us. It's not to be fooled by it. It's like a magic trick, but they cannot fool me, cannot fool me because I know what's behind that. And you know, without a little bit of Maya, there wouldn't be anything here. So our job is just to know it's an illusion. It's not real. It's like we're all in a play and we're all playing our, in it, a play can be incredibly moving or a film in our day and age, or it can be incredibly moving and transcending, but we know it's not real. So that's the difference. It's not, it doesn't take away from the value of it. It's just you have to know, take all the value from it, enjoy it, make it, but you know in the back of your head, that's not the ultimate reality. That's a great question. You are awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. I think every day you should ask yourself what you do, nourish yourself. Yes, exactly right. It's really great to digest this great, huge issue. Happy to meet you. Thanks, Donald. Oh, how nice. I think I haven't. Oh, I see. I found it easy to connect with my inner sense of being during lockdown. Now that we have opened up more here in England, the pool of the outer world seems to have returned. Is this common? It is so common. It's very common also when we give retreats. You know, and you have like for six days, seven days, ten days, you are totally in there and you have this amazing experience with meditation. You are in nature and you really know, want this to be part of your life. And then you come back to your home, you know, and there is your kids or your partners or your friends or your jobs or the city or whatever it is. And it just pulls you out of it. And our habits win every time. That's one a big, big issue in the Gita also, the, the habits. You know, the habits, they are the, he's the teacher of both the good and the bad cousins. A habit is always going to, that's why we have to create habits. It's not enough to have a great experience in a, in a retreat. That's great to awaken something. But if you don't make a habit of it in your life, the other habits are going to win. It's always uh, going to be like this. And... I think that it's, uh, 
incredibly natural to be pulled by these things, but we just need to make a huge effort to create at least one habit that is going to pull me in that other direction. For me, it's meditation. You know, whatever is happening in my life, there is that thing every morning I'm going to sit and I'm going to sit and I'm going to shut the whole thing out and I'm going to stay with it. We need to create these other habits. Otherwise, the world is always going to win. But I do think that every time we experience it, we make, we feed it a little bit. And if you can make one habit in your life, create one little thing in your life that connects you to that feeling, you already made a huge step. And believe when I say, believe me when I say it, one little habit is going to be super difficult to create. The second habit, it's going to be a little less difficult. And the more you can establish this in your life, the easier it will become, the less energy it will cost. But it's super, super common. It's a great point that you put in there. I don't think I missed anything. Uh, yeah, I found it easy to connect. Thank you. Very nice. I think every day you should. Yeah. Could you please send the version of the Bhagavad Gita you mentioned during the talk today? Sure. I have uh, two. So the one I'm sent is from Yogananda. God talks to Arjuna. We can definitely put it in some channel or other. Uh, I also love very much the Eknath Esvaran. But his is very, is very beautiful, very poetic, very touching. But it's more the common thing. The, the, the special thing about Yogananda is how he connects the characters to the aspects in us. It's not easy to read. You have to have a lot of patience. I made a project. I read like 10 pages every day. And that got me through. It's um, not always very easy. He's very religious also. He makes lots of reference to even, um, he compares a lot to Hinduism with Catholicism. You have to have space in your mind for those things. Uh, <laughs> not to fight against. <laughs> okay, I think this is uh, it. I'm going to give you a few more seconds here, just seeing things coming, but I think the questions have been answered. Guys, I cannot say how grateful I am to have anybody in this world who wants to uh, listen to this. <laughs> I am incredibly grateful for you and I hope you had a good time. By all means, send questions later. If your question, if you didn't have time or questions come up late, uh, later to you, I am more than help more than happy to uh, spend any time <laughs> talking about this or answering your questions. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Namaste.